All right. It's good to be here. Um, got a few things to talk about here. Mostly what I want to spend some time on is, is talking a little bit about what we've done over the course of uh, the last 14 years building a brand uh, and some of the things that we've built to get us here. Uh, so, uh, to, so to start, let's see, there we go. Um, I've been here at Zappos for nine years. Uh, when I first joined, we were a scrappy startup. Um, we, uh, we had one common goal, and that was that we wanted to build the absolute best customer experience. And, uh, and so, uh, so we did that. And, and, uh, and prior to that, I, I co-founded a small company. Um, and, uh, and after realizing, uh, after three years of trying to build this company, um, and, and, uh, and, and having some, great, some good success, um, realized that my passion was really in marketing and applying the technical discipline that I had from kind of the systems role that I was playing before. Um, so now what I do is I manage, I head the, the traffic team, so all the traffic that comes into the site, um, that's for, uh, for Zappos, our sister site, 6PM, and our Couture site, um, and I lead the teams that, uh, that drive the traffic for that, uh, for that group. Uh, so, so that you're aware, uh, so I get, this is the kind of the, the thing that I get asked all the time is where we're located. We are located in Las Vegas. Um, we, are, uh, we were strategically placed in Las Vegas because it was one of the few towns that gave us that 24-7 center or 24 seven, um, experience that we could kind of bring people, get, get our, our call service up, running, and, and have those people, the, the right talent that we needed to continue to grow our business and, and be able to serve um, um, our customers the best that, uh, in the way that we felt was necessary. Um, one of the downsides to being to Las Vegas, I mean, aside from being there, you get, to, you get a lot of, uh, you know, good people watching, you learn a lot about people, you get, uh, there's, there's, it's kind of an entertaining place to be, an entertaining place to, to build a business. Uh, but one of the downsides to being in Las Vegas is it gets very hot. And, uh, and, uh, and so one of the things that I deal with is, uh, you know, in, in uh, June, July, this time of year, um, it gets up to, uh, you know, 120 degrees, which is 50 degrees Celsius. Um, and, uh, and so like any sane person, um, I leave town. And, uh, and a lot of people, uh, um, you know, do the same thing. So this is my family. Um, two weeks ago, we went on a trip. We went up, went up north to the Lake Tahoe area, for those who are aware of the area, and, uh, <clears throat> and we took in the scenery. Now, this isn't meant to be a travelogue, but I do have some things that are, that are kind of interesting here. So in that area, there's a really cool forest. It's a redwood forest, and what you're looking at right there is a coastal redwood. Um, this is, uh, what's, what's so great about that, as you can, can see um, clearly below, the, uh, the trees underneath it are significantly smaller than it. Um, and so much so that this tree uh, can grow up to 370 feet tall. Um, it gets up to 40 feet in diameter. Um, but it has a few other characteristics that are very unique to it. And, and one of the things that, uh, and there's several things that I think are really interesting about, about trees. And, and so allow me to geek out for a moment, moment as I talk about um, what's so interesting about these trees. Um, you know, there's a couple things. Um, the first is that um, they are very, you know, they've been around for thousands of years. It's one of what they call old forest, one of the few um, in the world. And uh, it has a very fibrous bark. It's so, it's so thick, the bark is so thick, it's up to two feet uh, thick. Um, and it is, it is so fibrous that it's fire retardant. So as fires sweep through, um, and wipe out the undergrowth underneath it, um, it stands still and, and, and seems to, to, to be impervious to fire. Uh, the other thing is that it produces this tannic acid, and the acid actually repels um, bugs and insects, and, and, uh, and so it, uh, it, it, you don't see any insects or any pests that actually you know, kind of are tearing at these, these, these age-old, thousand-year-old trees. Um, but another thing that's interesting is that since they're so large, these trees grow um, and get up to be about four million pounds. Um, as the wind blows it, it starts to get a little off kilter and there's so much weight that it starts to grow limbs out to counterbalance itself. So as it's growing up and it's getting larger and larger, it throws out these limbs that counterbalance its weight so that it continues to, con to climb into the stratosphere. Um, and then, uh, you know, the last thing is that 
Um, it takes these, these roots, and rather than going deep into the ground, it depends on the strength of the forest around it, and it we interweaves its long root structure and locks it itself into the other trees, the surrounding trees. And so as the forest grows, it grows. And as the forest gets stronger, it gets stronger. Um, and it has so many of these great things, um, but uh, you know, it, it has no known natural cause of death. So they found some trees that are, you know, three, four, even 5,000 years old. They've never, you know, and they just continually um, evolve. But the last thing that's really interesting about these trees, um, well, it's two more things, but, uh, but one of the things that I really like about these trees is that, uh, you know, they, they, they grow in this one particular region, and they're very rare, uh, and they, they require just these certain conditions to actually thrive. And they all stem from a seed that is about the size of a, um, a, uh, an oatmeal flake. Um, and so you have these massive trees, and the DNA is put together in these really small, it's just a small seed. Um, so I clearly didn't come halfway around the world uh, to talk about trees. Uh, while I believe that trees are an amazing thing and, and that you should spend time with nature, uh, I think there's a lot more to this story, um, and this is what I think is worth sharing. Um, there's a lot that can be compared to a brand. Um, brands, um, the good brands, the brands that are enduring, the brands that continue to thrive and build and grow, are brands that are built on things, on the similar things that, that what we find with these trees. Um, a good brand learns to thrive, is, is able to thrive in, through adversity. So as macroeconomic changes happen and, and um, you know, structural challenges happen, um, all the other competing brands start to fade away as the economy starts to pull them down, whereas uh, the good brands are the brands that actually see that as a market opportunity and they grow and they develop. Um, they also have an, an innate inherent ability to autocorrect as their weight grows and they get larger. They have this massive ability to shift their weight kind of almost automatically, inherently, um, to compensate um, from, for, the, for the growth and the weight of that organization. And so they do all these different things. Um, and, uh, and, and what it really comes down to is the question that we, that we sometimes ask ourselves. Is it, is it a, a procedure that you've put in place to, to, to structure the organization, or is, it, uh, or is it the actual structure itself that allows for that growth? And, uh, and, and a procedure, an example of a procedure is, is essentially what happens when you build an organization. Um, and as an opportunity comes up, and as a challenge comes up, and it's in, and introduces that, that challenge into the organization, the, uh, the upper management will push down a procedure on how to handle that situation. And so the, the team is constantly waiting, is waiting for the, 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 the stimulus, and then the, then the senior leadership pushes down a procedure for how you should handle that. And so it's a very reactive process for managing a business. Whereas a structure is uh, building within that a self-governing organization that's built around principles or core values. And these values guide the organization, instruct how you build and hire the right people, how you fire the people that are not, that are not kind of helping you and, and, and shifting and, and, and buckling or shifting with the weight of the organization. Um, it's the ability to be, to be uh, you know, nimble and quick and, and, and proactive as, a as opposed to reactive. And so, um, so that's really what I'm getting to is, is why has Zappos been so successful? Now, um, for those who don't know, Zappos is a, is a, is a brand um, in, uh, in, uh, in the United States. It's predominantly in the United States. We, we do some business outside, but very little. Um, but the, the growth has been phenomenal. I've been there nine years, and in that process, I've seen the, the company grow from, from uh, you know, tens of millions to now uh, you know, 20 or 30 times that size. And, and the, the growth, um, like the, uh, the coastal redwood, um, as the company gets larger, 
Um, and as the tree gets larger, it actually grows faster, and it grows and it accelerates. And because it's accelerating, because you have a, a structure that is perpetuating that growth. So we're going to get into a little bit of that. So the the this growth is built on a lot of different principles. And and right here you have our our, uh, our CEO Tony Shea. Um, and, and the philosophy at Zappos is that if you are at work, you should feel like you are at play. You should feel like what you are doing is, is a movement. You are a part of a movement and you are a part of a change. And, and the idea is that, uh, that if you are not um, excited about coming to work, then you're probably not in the right place. Um, essentially, what happens is you get people, some people that are focused on a job, they're, they're committed to getting a job that will pay the bills and that will help them to grow and, and, to, to, and to pay for their, their time when they're not at work and when they're on the nights and their weekends. It, it, it's the sole purpose is to provide for that, uh, that, you know, that opportunity outside. The second is a career, which is essentially a, a, a conviction to the discipline that they, that they have. Um, and that is if they're an accountant, they want to develop their accounting skills and they want to be uh, proficient in that, in that discipline. And so if they leave the company, they can go on to some other company and they can develop that discipline. But the last in what we look for and what we strive to do in our hiring process and what we strive to do as we build our organization is find people that are looking for a calling. And now what a, what a calling is, is it's a, it's a dedication to the discipline, a desire to, to build that discipline, but, but more importantly, it's a desire to be a part of a movement. And the movement is that we believe we can change the world. And it, we can do that by disrupting the way e-commerce is done. And so um, by hiring these right people, we're able to do some, some interesting things. Um, you know, we, we tend to look for people that are a little off kilter, that are, that are a little weird. But one of the things that we look for in weird people is not the craziest people in the room. We could go and find those all over the place. But what we want to find are people that are comfortable making mistakes, people that are comfortable failing and looking a little different. Because those are the people that are going to be the most honest. There's no blurry lines with what they're, what, what they're able to, to do. There, there's no loss in translation. They are who they are. And um, we tr spend the time to, to get there. But we also, you know, this uh, little cartoon um, is kind of an interesting piece, but it illustrates the major flaw that most companies have with customer service. And that is that there should be transparency within the organization. So there should be no confusion as to what kind of data is coming into the organization and what kind of decisions are being made off of that data. And once people understand how things operate and we can build a culture of, of transparency, then everyone in the organization um, shifts to become the evangelist of the company. And as, as the entire organization is evangelizing the company in a true fashion, not, not contrived, um, in a true fashion, um, then the organization itself grows. And so not to discount PR, but essentially what that means is that Every part member of the organization is an ambassador for the organization, and they are able to speak on behalf of the company um, in a public forum and in, in doing things like what I'm doing today. Um, but uh, but they're also um, able to kind of share what our vision is and what we're what we're shooting to accomplish. And this is all based on these guiding principles, these core values. And, and, and uh, you know, we believe that, um, we, that, that it is not just something that you hang on the wall that you talk about um, in your higher training, but you actually hire and fire on these principles. These are the things that guide our decisions every day. They guide who we, who we, uh, we put our faith in and who we trust, uh, who we trust in and those who we um, uh, decide to part ways with. All right, so all of that is good, but how does that actually equate to marketing? And that's really what I'm supposed to fo focus on here. And it really comes down to um, this whole idea. We've, we've built this whole system. The structure is aligned. It's able to support its own weight. But how are we actually building our organization to do what the, or what the structure is meant to do? And, uh, and it really comes down to these three areas, and that is capture, 
capture the information from our customers, analyze that information through some, some technology that we built, and then have that technology action, immediately apply some action to it. And so um, here's an example of some, some retargeting that we've done in the past. Um, and what you'll see in this retargeting is, uh, um, you know, this, these examples here, is that uh, there's a couple of things that, that we should point out. The first is we give, uh, we educate the consumer. We educate the user on what, they, what it is that they're seeing. Why are they seeing these ads? What is it that, that, that um, how, how did this information even get collected on them? The second is that we give them control over the unit. They can decide how they want to see it, if they want to opt out of it, if they want to, to receive it in some other format. Um, and then lastly, we take the feedback that they, that they submit to us and we use that to throttle its growth. So rather than having ROI or, or CPA or some other target um, drive the growth of that, of that platform or that campaign, what we do is we take another metric, the metric is negative sentiment to impression ratio, and we use that to dictate how we grow the program. Because our number one focus as an organization is how our customers behave and how they, how they uh, perceive the experience to be. If we're making a lot of money, but we're not satisfying the needs of our customers, um, then it's not something that we want to keep investing in. Second is this concept of a life cycle. You know, a lot of, a lot of companies, what they do is they focus on a channel, and that channel is, is where they invest their time and energy. And so each, each channel within their marketing mix has a budget and a portfolio, and they maximize the revenue against that portfolio. But in reality, it competes with the real action which is what is happening at the customer level. And so if you, if you look at this kind of conceptual drawing here, um, this is more or less how we think about marketing. In each phase of the life cycle, in each line along that, that graph, you see a portion, and that is a, these are mutually exclusive groups, and in these mutually exclusive groups, you'll see that these are phases within a life cycle. These customers have performed a certain action and the idea is to increase the volume of each phase and the velocity at which it moves to the next phase. And so by setting targets at that level, we're no longer thinking about how is paid search working or how is social paid working. We, we think of how is acquisition, awareness, first purchase, retention. We think of it in terms of how the customer is progressing because ultimately that is what matters is the growth of the customer program. The other thing is, is measurement. Uh, quite often what you find is, is a, the, in order to get the right output, you need the right input. And you need to spend your time to investigate and understand what the input is. Far too often what people do is they look at conversion rate as the, the end all be all of uh, a company or a site's health. But really what it is, is it's just a measurement of orders divided by, by, uh, uh, by visits, and that gives you an aggregate conversion. But if your goal is to, to acquire customers, and existing customers generate a two times greater C, uh, CVR, conversion rate, and they um, convert at about 30% better AOV, then what you're essentially doing is you are optimizing your site around existing customers and neglecting your new, your, your new visitors or your new customers. So another way to take that is cut it down by visitor type. And so you're essentially taking it and saying, I want to I break it out by new visitors, existing visitors, customers, uh, and, and by understanding your different, your different segments and then doing that calculation that way, you're always building a site that's optimized around a balance of new visitors, existing visitors, and customers. Thirdly, you've got to, you've got to build your KPIs around this. And so um, data and, and the science behind this can't be misunderstood. And so while you've got these measurements and these abilities, if you are building a program that's built around customer acquisition just to carry the theme through, and you're building in this customer acquisition program, but you are maximizing or you're optimizing on a gross revenue ROI, essentially what you're doing is to the same issue. You are, your bid systems are all kicking in, and they're all maximizing the revenue, but that revenue is most easily acquired through your existing customer base. And so 
Acquisition becomes a byproduct of max ROI, but not the actual output. And so uh, a focus, a careful focus, once you understand the metrics, is to go back and, uh, and identify the right metric. The right metric in this case, if it's acquisition, is a CPA campaign. It should be optimized on the cost uh, against the, the actual customers that we're acquiring and backed out to optimize for the growth of the new customer um, in, as, a, uh, as the campaign. Lastly, the personalization. And, and, and it's important that you kind of follow this flow, but only once you have done all of those things do you truly understand what the output should be for a customer. You, that is the only point that you know what you should show the customer because you don't, without having those proper measurements and without having a, you know, the attribution system and without understanding um, you know, what it is that motivates those customers, you don't necessarily know what to show them. And so it's a combination of all of these things um, that give you that ability. So there are a lot of trees out there. There are a lot of, uh, you know, massive opportunities and massive trees and rare, you know, these rare growth companies that you see out there. But there's only a few that reach the size and scale and continue to grow under their own weight. And I hope that uh, this share sheds a little light and what it is that we've taken, uh, what we've done to kind of build our, uh, our coastal redwood. Thank you.